So I'm Stephen Bornstein. I'm the director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Center for Applied Health Research, which helped organize this special lecture. I'm honored to welcome you to this year's David Hawkins Lectureship in Health Sciences Research. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the territory in which we are meeting as the ancestral homelands of the Bilatok and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Beyond. I would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukhavut and the Inu of Nitasanan and their ancestors as the original peoples of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and as we honor this beautiful land together. Today's lectureship is named in honor of Dr. David Hawkins, who was the third dean of our university's faculty of medicine. He served from 1987 to 1995. In 1991, I guess while he was still dean of medicine, he was also vice president and then interim president of the Medical Research Council of Canada, which as most of you undoubtedly know, has now morphed into CIHR. In 1993, near his retirement date, the Medical Research Council and the university jointly endowed this lectureship called the annual David Hawkins Lectureship in Health Sciences Research. I think the first one's held in 2004, and that means if they were annually held, this is, I don't know, the 19th. Something like that. <laughs> no, not really. You can tell I'm a qualitative researcher. <laughs> um, Dr. Hawkins passed away in 2011 and continues to be remembered by people who knew him, but also through events like this. It's my pleasure to introduce today this year's lecturer, Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw, who comes to us from the Ottawa Health Research Institute and the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. He's a world leader in implementation research and in knowledge translation, otherwise known as KT. Dr. Grimshaw is a physician by his original training and a researcher by subsequent training and practice and application. He's a senior science, scientist in clinical epi at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, and a tier one Canada research chair in health knowledge transfer and uptake. He was recently inducted into the Royal Society of Canada. He is also a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and a corresponding fellow of the Royal College of Edinburgh, and I'm hoping you'll explain to me what that means <laughs> afterwards. He has twice, twice received the CIHR Knowledge Translation Award. He's the former leader of Cochrane Canada and the current president of the board of the Campbell Collaboration, International Campbell Collaboration. In 2018, CIHR awarded him the Bearer Flood Award for career achievements in health services and policy research. He has produced over 550 peer-reviewed articles and has received $50 million in CIHR funding as a principal investigator and even more as a co-investigator. And this count was done a couple of weeks ago, so by now there may be another 20 articles and another couple of million dollars in funding. Uh, in addition, uh, Dr. Grimshaw has played an important role in supporting and facilitating the development 
at the center that I revolve with of the program in knowledge translation that we call CRISP, the Contextualized Health Research Synthesis Program. This afternoon's lecture, as you can see from the millions of screens, <laughs> is entitled, Show Me the Evidence, Building the Global Knowledge Architecture to Improve Health. It will no doubt ignite interesting discussions and we will have a Q&A session afterwards that I'll attempt to moderate. After the lecture, I hope you will all join us next door for a small reception. And then on Friday, even if it snows, <laughs> uh, Dr. Grimshaw will do a special grand rounds in lecture theater eight, A, sorry, lecture theater A of this building when he will discuss the idea of learning health systems and how to achieve them. I'd like to give special thanks to the Office of the Dean of Medicine uh, and the Office of the Vice President of Research who helped us organize this talk, and in particular to the staff of NLCHR who did all the heavy lifting. It now gives me great pleasure on behalf of Memorial to invite Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw to do the <coughs> annual lecture. Uh, good afternoon. Can I just check, is the microphone on and working? Hit me in the back? That's great. Okay. So it's a real pleasure to be here, so thank you very much for um, the invitation. Before we start, it's always nice to get some sense of who's in the room. So, I mean, could, you know, I want to show a hand. So how many people are medical students or other students at the moment at the moment? Could you put your hands up? Okay, thank you. All right. How many people are faculty? How many people are healthcare professionals? How many people are patients? Any other categories that I can think of that you want to hand up? Senior administrators. Administrators. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. It's useful, it's just helpful to know. Um, so, when I got the invitation, um, I, we arrived in Canada in 2002, and I don't think my path ever crossed with David Hawkins. So, I did you know, try and look him up and see. And, and Stephen's already largely sort of summarized uh, his, his, his illustrious career. One of the things he didn't say is that he also acted as executive director of the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada uh, between 1995 and 2006. So this is the organization that, uh, where the, which actually represents the medical schools on the national stage that helps them think about working together but also advocating for high quality medical education. And, and I guess the way, you know, trying to read between the lines, you got the sense of someone clearly who was very highly uh, rated as a scientist, but also someone who's very passionate about the educational mission. And uh, so I hope what I'm going to say today would have been inter of interest to him. Um, um, and maybe uh, if anyone in the audience actually knew him, you can tell me after it's either he'd have hated that or, well, that's kind of okay. We'll see. Um, so I want to talk about a quiet revolution in our professional lifetime. So the picture on the left is uh, my graduation day from medicine in Edinburgh in 1984. And that's a more recent one. I've not aged that well. So it never <laughs> um, when I was in medical school, the predominant model was an apprentice model. We learned from textbooks which were way out of date, and we sat at the feet of experts, and they told us how to practice. There's virtually no emphasis on research evidence, keeping up to date, or preparing myself for my professional career. And frankly, by the time I left medical school, I was ill-prepared for um, what would have happened if I, if I was working in a, in a clinical environment. What I'd hoped, and what I believe, is for the medical students in the audience today, when you graduate, you're gonna be much more sophisticated in your knowledge about research evidence and how you can thoughtfully incorporate it into your practice as you move forward. And what I want to talk about today is the role of systematic reviews as one of the key methodologies that I think has driven um, the movement for evidence-based medicine for a more or, or better incorporation of evidence into, um, uh, into the care that we provide to our patients. 
Stephen's already mentioned some of my roles. So one of the things about saying this is that I'm, I'm like a, 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 a participatory researcher. Um, so Stephen's a qualitative researcher. I have been very actively involved in many of the organizations I'm going to talk about for the last 30 years. This is, so I'm not an unbiased observer. This is a really important part about how I see um, how science needs to be, to be developed if it's going to be viable to society. Um, so you need to judge what I say on that basis. And if I can answer any questions about these organizations, um, I shall. So I want to start with an idealistic medical student in the 1930s. So this is um, Archie Cochran. He was a medical student in, the 19, in London in the 1930s. And at that time, they were starting to have societal discussions about whether the UK should have a national health service. And as a medical student, he decided he was going to go to a rally uh, about the NHS in London. Um, but as he notes, um, he really wasn't very good about fitting into organisational groups. If you read about him, he's a very iconoclastic guy. So it's a bit like uh, probably the, the Marx Brother quote that I don't want to be a, a member of a club that will have me. Um, he's very much like that. So he went by himself, but he basically wrote his own banner. And the banner, the slogan on the banner was all effective treatments must be free. He was very left wing uh, uh, um, oriented. Um, um, and you know, he was thinking if we had a public health care system, then treatments are effective, should be made free to citizens who, uh, who are attending uh, their physicians, their nurses, whatever. One of the interesting things is in the 1930s, we had virtually no evidence about what treatments were effective. We didn't actually have any research method to know what treatments were effective. So although this was a great sort of aspiration, um, if the NHS had been sat up the day after and someone had said to Archie Cochrane, okay, tell us what are effective treatments, he would have probably scratched his head. So, we need to fast forward maybe uh, 20 years. Uh, in between these times, Archie Cochrane dropped out of, well, he took a leave of absence from medical school to go and fight in the Spanish Civil War. And he also served as the medical officer during the Second World War. He was captured. Um, he acted as a med medical officer in a prison camp, and he did his first controlled study in a prison camp um, that persuaded Germans to basically provide nutritional supplements to the, uh, the prisoners of war. So he wasn't inactive in the 20 years that we're talking about. But shortly after the war, this landmark study was published in the British Medical Journal. Um, so this was, uh, there have been randomized controlled trials before, but this was probably the start of the modern era of randomized controlled trials. It was a UK Medical Research Council streptomycin trial. So it basically tested whether streptomycin was effective in treating pulmonary TB. Prior to that, basically people got sent to sanatoriums and not much happened. The sick got better. <coughs> Lots of people um, didn't get better or died. But this very powerfully showed that streptomycin was um, um, a, a drug that led to reductions in uh, morbidity and mortality due to TB. And it's, it was a landmark in TB uh, treatment, but it's also a landmark in science because it actually said we have a powerful tool here that will allow us to start to work out what treatments work or not. So. Um, the idea behind a randomized controlled trial is remarkably simple. And I think sometimes that's one of the reasons people are a bit dismissive of them. To actually do a good randomized controlled trial is really, really difficult. So conceptually simple and eloquent, practically really hard. But the idea is we have a sample population, patients who've got pulmonary TB, um, identified by sputum or maybe um, um, x-rays, and you use some random procedure could be the roll of a dice, a flip of a coin. Now we use centralized computerized randomization schema to basically randomize people into two different groups. One group will get the treatment, the streptomycin. One group will get a placebo or no intervention. Okay? And then we measure the outcome at some point in time. How many people are still alive at one year? And the idea behind the randomized controlled trial is that there are many <coughs> We know a lot of things about what might um, uh, uh, affect the outcome in TB. Nutrition might affect the outcome in TB. But there's lots of things we don't know. And if we don't use a random procedure, there's a danger that basically the groups that we're comparing are not like, like, by, are like for like. So the randomization process ensures that we have a like-to-like -like comparison and any difference between them 
is likely due to the intervention that we've got. Okay, and there's a very lot of sophisticated methodological uh, uh, theory behind it, but that's that's the basic uh, idea. Um, I want you to think. I'm going to talk about two different measures uh, for the, during the rest of the talk. One is what we call the effect size. So this is the difference in the outcome of interest between your two study groups. So you know, what, report, you know, what was the difference in the proportion of patients who survived with TB um, at one year? And that's the effect size. But whenever we do a trial, we're sampling from all possible patients in the world. And so there's some statistical uncertainty around what the true effect is. So this is very similar when you do, when you see um, polls for elections, you have a margin for error. And that's basically sort of saying, because we sampled randomly, we, you know, we kind of, it's plus or, two, uh, plus or minus 2%. It could be 2% lower, 2% higher. It's exactly the same in terms of, uh, of when we estimate sort of in trials, the effect size. What is the statistical uncertainty? So, Archie Cochrane grabbed hold of randomized controlled trials. Most of his time, he was, a, 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 um, an, et he was an etiological uh, epidemiologist. He studied uh, minor's lung disease in Wales, very deprived area. But he did actually participate in some of the early trials of aspirin in cardiovascular disease, for example. But he was a very strong advocate. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, if you're interested to know more, this is a book that is freely available. If you uh, go to that website, you can download it in probably any language you want. And it basically is a, a lay written, or a book written for lay audiences about what randomized trials are and why they're, they're kind of helpful. But Archie Cochrane, you know, basically grabbed hold of this idea that randomized controlled trial will help us understand what are effective treatments. And later in his career, in 1971, he was approached by the Nuffield Hospital Trust to do what was called a rock calling fellowship, and they had to produce a monograph. Uh, based on, uh, 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 on a particular subject matter. And his was called Effects and Efficiency, Random Reflections of the National uh, on, on Health Services. Um, there is an autobiography of Archie Cochrane, and he says, I kind of left this to the last minute. Now this was largely written late at night in my Welsh cottage under the influence of whiskey. <laughs> okay, you get a sense of who he was. In this book, he basically said, we now have tools to know what is effective. We should be promoting randomized controlled trials as a way to actually build science for healthcare. That's me, don't worry about that. Um, and <coughs> go away. Um, and one of the things he did is he looked across the healthcare scene at the time and he started to identify disciplines in medicine that were good or bad at using randomized controlled trials. And if you read the book now, it's still a really good read. Um, one of the groups he identified was cardiology, which today we'd find amazing because cardiology is probably the most evidence-based discipline. Well, cardiology and cancer are probably two of the most evidence-based disciplines we have. But it was a while before cardiology really picked this up and ran with it. But he decided to award a wooden spoon so a wooden spoon is a booby prize. Which discipline in medicine is the worst in terms of generating robust evidence about the effect of the interventions they do? And the winner of the wooden spoon was obstetrics. He said the obstetric, I apologize, well, you, you, 40 years, well, 32, 50 years on, I think obstetrics has a lot to be proud of. But 50 years ago, yeah, not very good at all. <laughs> Okay, so that was sort of, uh, you know, here, there, in this book, he'd moved from sort of just saying, oh, effective treatment should be true to, we know how to evaluate them with trials. And, you know, we should be sort of doing this as a routine area. About um, eight years, or six, seven years later, he was then asked to participate in a seminar on medicines in the year 2000. It feels very quaint now to sort of say there's a seminar in 1979 on medicines in the 2000s. Um, but in that, he made this quote. He went beyond the idea we need to do randomized controlled trials to we need to do, we need to collect the randomized controlled trials together so that healthcare professionals can use them to inform what their practice is. 
Yeah, so this was starting to make the link between doing the science and also making sure that was accessible and useful. He said, it's surely a great criticism of our profession that we've not organized a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty adapted periodically of all the relevant randomized controlled trials. Okay. So I want to um, introduce you to another idealistic young physician. Um, this is Ian Chalmers. Now, Sir Ian Thomas. And he, uh, again, is a very sort of left wing individual. And shortly after um, he finished medical school, he went to work in a Palestinian um, refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. And when he reflected on that, he said, That's where I started to get interested in evaluating the effects of healthcare. It dawned on him that there were some things he'd been taught in medical school which were probably lethally wrong. Things that he'd been told that in the Palestinian context led to real harm. And one example that he gives is um, using antibiotics for, uh, to prevent pneumonia or treat pneumonia in children with measles. Now in the UK, where we have good nutrition, good primary care, good hospital services, that was probably very reasonable advice to give. But in, for, for kids uh, in Palestinian uh, uh, refugee camps in Gaza, who probably lived in awful conditions, had bad nutrition, had bad health care, that actually probably led to people dying, or kids dying. And when he went back and had a look at this, he found there were in fact six randomized trials that suggested that per, certainly for these sort of uh, ch children who were not well nourished, um, you know, antibiotics would have been successful. <coughs> they would have they'd actually done, be had benefit. But you know, he wasn't aware of those, he'd not been taught about them, and you know, he's, he still to this day will uh, be very emotional about the fact that you know, basically people died under his watch because he didn't know what to do. So when he came back to the UK, Ian went and did training, uh, or research training, um, and he started to work in perinatal epidemiology. And he got to know Archie Cochran, but he took on Archie Cochrane's um, uh, uh, challenge. It is short, you know, obstetrics is worse, and why don't we have a catalogue of all the randomised controlled trials in the world in obstetrics? And this was pre-internet. This was um, pre-Medline. Or there was a version of Medline, but it's pretty rudimentary on, on microfiche, and it was really hard to find these trials. He decided, he, so they did very careful searches of you know, what they could, but he also decided the way to find all the randomized controlled trials in the world was to write out to 40,000 healthcare professionals working in obstetrics, so obstetricians, midwives, labor, unit, uh, labor uh, ward uh, nurses, um, health visitors, to ask them to identify any randomized controlled trials you go. Hope you get an idea that Ian doesn't think small. Well, okay, let's find 40,000 people in the world and just write to them and say, will you help us? Um, and what he then did was to think about, well, how do we bring that, all that information together? And he produced um, something called Effective Care in Pregnancy and Childbirth. There were three uh, editors of this, so Ian's uh, photo is, is uh, on the left-hand screen. The person next to him, who looks a bit like Santa Claus, is Murray Enkin, who is a professor of obstetrics in McMaster, uh, and you know, one of you know, an amazing uh, uh, guy. Um, if you're interested in this book, it's available at the Memorial Health Sciences Library. <laughs> and it looks very battered, so I assume it's been much loved at some point in time, but I'm not sure. I think we were probably the uh, last people in the last two or three years to take it out. Take it out, give it some love. This is a remarkable achievement. Um, it was published in uh, 1989. It involved 98 authors from 13 countries. Uh, there are 1,500 pages and it cost 225 pounds. Um, in today's prices, it, that would be around about 700 Canadian bucks. So this wasn't an easy, this wasn't something that you'd go into your medical bookstore and want to go out and buy if you're a casual sort of student, do, or if you're a student doing a, a block of obstetrics. This is a kind of pretty uh, a major initiative. Um, what I want to do is talk through some of the innovation that was around this. 
that a lot of people now might recognize, but not actually realize what a true intellectual achievement this book was. So the first thing that uh, they did is they committed not only to produce lists of trials, but also to do systematic reviews. So they used rigorous scientific approaches to interrogate the evidence to basically sort of try and understand whether treatments did more harm than good. And they also uh, were able to use a relatively new statistical technique called meta-analysis, which allows you to pool information across studies to basically try and under you know, understand what the signal is, not in one single study, but across a whole body of evidence. Um, and I'm going to read you, talk you through this chapter. Uh, Patricia Crowley, um, is, which is now retired, but was a professor of obstetrics in Dublin. Um, and this is, uh, this is a landmark systematic review for changed care. And I'll just talk about you through with that. So the issue here is about promoting pulmonary maturity. So if you are, uh, um, uh, one of the problems is when babies are born very prematurely, their lungs have not matured sufficiently, and there's a real risk that they will have to develop something called respiratory distress syndrome, and that will require them probably to spend time in the neonatal intensive care units, they might die. They're also at increased risk of a, brain, of a bleed into the brain. Um, one of the interventions that, they were, that um, Patricia and colleagues were interested in is whether if you give a steroid to the mother when she goes into premature labor, does that accelerate the maturity of the lungs in the baby and does that lead to a better outcome? There were some animal studies from the 60s or so, and there were a number of trials that people were aware of. Uh, so Patricia did this review, and by the time EPC was published, she identified 12 different trials. And they were presented in tables like these. Today, we would call this a forest plot, okay? And most people, or many people, would know how to read it. At the time, this was a completely new way of presenting information and it presents a very profound amount of information in a relatively simple way. What I want to do is just talk you through um, the top line so you understand what these columns are, and then we can talk about the implications of the review. So if we looked at the, uh, the, the left-hand side of the screen, each row represents a single randomized controlled trial. So this was the first study that was published in 1972 uh, from a New Zealand group and there's a study identifier, so you can go back and look at it. The next columns tell us how many mothers were randomized to the study groups and the number of babies with the outcome of interest, in this case, respiratory distress. So 532 mothers were randomized to receive steroids, and 538 were randomized controlled. 49 babies from the mothers who, who um, uh, got steroids had respiratory distress syndrome, so about 9%, 84, of the mothers who got no steroid um, um, got respiratory distress syndrome, so about a 50 or you know 15, 16 percent, and then the odds ratio uh, is basically just sort of uh, uh, telling us that you know this in this trial there's about a 44 percent reduction in the odds that a baby would have respiratory distress syndrome if it got a steroid, and then these figures are the statistical uncertainty. Although in this study we identified it was about a 44 percent reduction. It could be anything from 21% um, to 61% uh, to 20%, 20% to 60%, okay? If we then move on to the, whoops, oh, okay, I didn't pop that. We then move on to the right-hand side of the graph, it just presents the same data in a different way. So this is, this is the odds ratio, but then what we have is the effect size and statistical uncertainty presented graphically. So you'll see there's a little dot in the middle, and that's the effect size. And then you've got a line that stretches either side of that, and that's our statistical uncertainty. And alongside the line, there is um, basically a line of no effect. And if your statistical uncertainty line crosses a line of no effect, we would say that that trial was not statistically significant. So even if we observed a difference, we don't have confidence due to uh, statistically that it was a real difference, okay? The statistical uncertainty is impacted by a lot of things, but in particular the size of the study. And one of the problems in medicine, we have lots of trials which are underpowered, and so you might be in a situation where you miss an effect because even though there is an effect, we don't have enough 
you have power to do bankrupt. So if we then go back to this graph, there are 12 trials published from 1972 to 1984. If you look down here, you can see this line clearly, um, uh, uh, um, the, the confidence intervals or the statistical uncertainty proxies. But when we look down, we can see there's six, uh, six trials that where, the, 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 uh, where statistically significant results are found, and six trials where they weren't, okay? But notice that in most of the trials, apart from this one, it did look as though the effect size suggested there was benefit. But if you were kind of just looking at this body of evidence, you might say, well, six trials say it works, six trials it doesn't, says it doesn't. Uh, we don't know what to do. Remember I talked about meta-analysis. Meta-analysis allows us to pool study across data. So instead of having 12 trials of different sample size, it actually allows us to say, what happens if we have one kind of mega study with about, in this case, 3,600 um, women randomized? So that's what we have here. And what you can see is you've got sort of basically a, the effect size is about a 52% you know, reduction in the odds of, uh, of a baby having respiratory distress syndrome. And um, with, a, with a confidence interval that's a long way away from the no effect line. <coughs> this was completely new. It wasn't based on going out and using, you know, collecting new data. It was about maximizing what we can get from the available data. This is now something we take as routine. It was not in any way when this was done. You know, so a lot of what we do now rests on the shoulders of Patricia Crowley, Ian Chalmers, Murray Anthony. And this has now become standard practice, certainly in Canada, around the world, there's some uncertainties about whether actually without neonatal intensive care you should be doing this, so there's an issue about low medical coaches. But what does that mean? What does that mean in real terms? Well, um, in Ontario we have the Better Outcomes Register and Network, and this basically collects data on all the um, uh, uh, maternal and perinatal outcomes in pregnancy. Uh, between April 2018 and March 2019, there were 3,281 deliveries preterm between 24 to 36 weeks. So 3,281 pregnancies where the babies were at risk of this. Um, about 2,025% of mothers after received antenatal cortical steroids. There's a whole other talk about, well, why was that 40% not getting it as well? But within that 2,025 mothers, um, <coughs> receiving antenatal cortical steroids, that would lead to 105 fewer babies with respiratory distress syndrome. Either babies that didn't have to go into neonatal intensive care unit or uh, basically had a much shorter stay. It led to 50 fewer babies with, uh, with, with brain hemorrhages. And it led to 57 fewer babies dying. That is in, okay, albeit the largest jurisdiction in Canada, but in one, basically in one jurisdiction of 18, 19,000, whatever we are now, you know, 50 lives were saved as a result of this piece of work. And when Archie Cochran talked about all effective treatments being free in 1930, we didn't have any effective treatments. It probably didn't matter. You know, we used to give people colored water and hope they'd get better. We now have a lot of very profound <coughs> interventions that can really impact on a population basis and impact on individual lives. We also have lots of experience where people, um, where what we think are very sexy and likely to be very effective interventions, I'll talk about, about that one later, prove not to be. So this is a very powerful tool for making sense about what we should do. This is kind of the high tech end of effective care in pregnancy and childbirth. What they also did was sort of look at a whole range of practices which were common in obstetric care at that time. And they basically found that there were no, there's no evidence for at least 60 things that were done quite commonly. And most of these were not high tech, you know, big outcomes, but they would, um, they would, I think, have a significantly negative impact on the woman's experience of giving child, of a childbirth. And so, and so the things that, um, you know, they're able to say should be abandoned in the light of available evidence were shaving prior to delivery, giving an enema routinely, prior to delivery, making the mother lie down throughout the pregnancy, throughout the labor prior to delivery, using a certain type of suture, which actually was associated with more painful uh, uh, consequences from that, and separating healthy mothers and babies. So 
the antenatal corticosteroids revolutionized healthcare, and there are probably tens of thousands of people now walking around because of that. I think this you know, will touch on millions of women every year. Okay? The, I would hope that no one in this room, if they, uh, 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 when they have childbirth, yeah, and no one approaches them with scissors suggesting that they should have a routine of physiotomy. No one approaches you with an enema. You know, and again, it's this sort of idea about using evidence to challenge a lot of, or using evidence to really think about what works, what doesn't, and being able to challenge what doesn't work. One of the things that, um, the establishment kind of hated this. The Ian Chalmers group was one to liken to the Baden-Meinhof of epidemiologists. Baden-Meinhof was a German terrorist group in the 1970s. What this did was sort of say, you know, we don't, we, we don't, we'll listen to experts, but we want experts to back up their expertise with evidence. That's a very kind of profound change if you're used to your whole power structure being based on the fact that I'm an expert. Okay? So um, I think these were revolutionary books. A couple of things that, were, that followed on. This cost $700. There was a review of the, of the book that said, the only good thing about this book is your residents and fellows can't afford to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Murray Ankin, Mark Kersey and Chalmers worked with, I think it's the National Childbirth Trust in the UK, to produce a book which cost nine pounds. So maybe it's 20 bucks, something like that these days. And pregnant women bought it. Midwives bought it. Obstetricians bought it. GPs bought it. Uh, it was reprinted, I think, five times within the first 12 months of being produced. And so, yeah, if you look at this, it doesn't have all the meta-analysis graphs, but it actually translates those into here's the practical advice that if you are a midwife, you need to have. Okay? And again, that's one of the ideas that once you've got a definitive systematic review, you can repackage it in a whole range of ways to speak to different audiences and make it accessible to them. Ian and Murray and uh, Mark also recognised that this was out of date by the time it was published. Probably went into production, it was published in 89, somewhere in 1988, and there have been trials that should have been included that are already published. So, pre-internet, Almost pre-computing, um, they decided to create the Oxford database of perinatal trials. If you subscribe to this, every six months you get discs in the mail. I have now 89. There were probably five and a, there were probably five and a quarter, five and a quarter around three and a half inch discs. The young folk, don't worry. Uh, ask your grandparents about what they were. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, we, each six months said they continued search would identify new trials and the software would allow you to update the systematic reviews. So again, this is something now that we kind of take as, you know, uh, well, we take for granted, but it's very radical thinking and recognizing that technology could actually provide a new, uh, 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 new ways of thinking about knowledge. So one of the nice things is um, Archie Cochrane was able to, uh, was still alive when this was produced, and um, he wrote a forward, it's a very short forward, and the first thing he says is, this is great, and obstetricians, I apologize, I've taken the audience spoon back. You are now you know, the most evidence-based group in, in medicine. Um, but he, he, you know, he highlighted the, review, the, the systematic review of randomized controlled trials as presented as a new achievement. We represent a real milestone in the history of randomized trials and the evaluation of care, and I hope that this will be widely copied by other medical specialties. So this was a second challenge by Archie Cochran. So, back to um, Ian Chalmers. Um, Ian is probably one of the most uh, uh, intellectually rigorous people I know, but he's also a natural collaborator. You know, when they were working with 98 authors in this book using this new methodology, uh, the authors didn't meet for probably about until 10 years after that. They were kind of people who worked together because Ian had put them together. He's, he's, a, he's a very effective, well, well no, an effective catalyst. You know, the reason I got involved in this was because at some point in time, I got sucked into his aura and I got spat out and I was a computer convert. This picture is probably the best representation of that. 
In the 2000s, uh, the UK National Portrait Gallery wanted to do a series of portraits of Britain's thinkers. And they wanted to do a, a, a photo of Ian Chalmers. The other thing I should say about Ian is that he, he is remarkably humble. And what he would say is, but I, I, I've not done anything. It's all, I've worked with all these great people around the world that will actually, that will actually mean that, uh, we, uh, that, that, that this work gets done. Um, and so he persuaded them that he would have his photograph taken if he could find a way of representing his network. And this is this, this wonderful photograph. And that's his of it. Um, and when it came to the idea of can we take effective care and prevention childbirth and apply it in other sectors, Ian, with a few other colleagues that I'll talk about, were the catalysts. So after they published Effective Care and Pregnant Childbirth, Ian persuaded the NHS r and um, uh, funder, which was just started, to fund an, a UK Cochrane Centre to advance the work of Effective Care and Pregnant Childbirth, but see whether there was a global interest in establishing a global body to try and achieve this. And in 1993, he pulled together 95 people, at, no, sorry, about 75 people from across the world um, to as an exploratory meeting of should we establish something which we'll call the Cochrane Collaboration. And those a lot of those 75 people had never met each other before. They came from different uh, areas, infectious disease, pregnancy and childbirth, mental health, um, um, injuries, cardiovascular. Um, but actually over I think a two day meeting there's an agreement we should do something about this. And then the other thing about Ian is that he enthuses you to go back and do something. Yeah, he actually doesn't allow you to say, yeah, we'll do that, and then go home and forget about it. It's kind of like, yeah, first of all, you don't want Ian to be on the phone with you if you've irritated him, um, but, but he just makes you think you can do this. Yeah, we'll do it. Remember, it's that kind of, we we'll do it in the barn, guys. No one had money. This wasn't, we're going to go to an NIH and get kind of $50 million and do this. It's like, we'll just start. And if we fail, we fail. Well, well let's just go. Let's see where we get to. And that led to the Cochrane Collaboration. I got involved in 1994, so the year after this, but I've been involved ever since. So Cochrane is an international organization that aims to help people make well-informed decisions about healthcare by preparing, maintaining, and promoting the accessibility reviews of the effects of, of, effects of healthcare interventions. Um, it's a not-for-profit, it's independent, its money comes from public funding and some uh, uh, um, publishing revenues. The, one of the things about the, this, this definition is when we talk about people, we're thinking about citizens and their health choices. We're thinking about patients and their choices. We're thinking about healthcare professionals, whether they're physicians, nurses, OTs, pharmacists, whoever. We're thinking about mags and policymakers. This isn't a resource just for physicians, it's a global resource for people. Um, this was the original Cochrane logo, and this is actually the forest plot of the first seven trials from the corticosteroid review. So this was uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, the impact of that review. Cochrane has gone through a rebranding process, so it now looks a bit more sort of cleaner, a bit jazzier, a bit more 21st century, uh, but it's still the same um, icon there. There are now something like 11,000 members who are actively contributing to Cochrane from 130 countries around the world. They're doing reviews, they're helping with peer review, they're doing hand searching, they're doing a whole range of activities. And there are about 68,000 supporters who basically stay in touch with Cochrane because they see Cochrane's having value to them and they're willing to promote Cochrane. When I was preparing this, we had a look and there were about 50 members of Memorial University. Um, I know some of them, I don't know others. Uh, and then the work of Cochrane is done by 52 review groups that focus on particular areas, dermatology, uh, wounds, pregnancy and childbirth, public health, and then we have you know, basically countries where there's a kind of geographic uh, representation. I want to say a little bit about the early influence of Canada in Cochrane. I already mentioned Murray Enkin, who was one of the cover authors of that. Um, the, the, this person is, is Jack Sinclair, and three years after Effective Care and Pregnancy and Childbirth, Jack Sinclair was a, um, well, it's John Sinclair, but he's called Jack, never quite get that. But um, uh, three years, he's a, uh, a, a, he was an epidemiologist at McMaster, and three years after Effective Care and Pregnancy and Childbirth, he produced Effective Care for Newborn Infants. So taking the prototype and applying it into a new clinical area. And then there's a broader McMaster group. 
So, um, well, that is Peter Tugwell. Peter chaired the first exploratory meeting. And talking to people who were there is that they say it wasn't clear that people would say, yes, we should do this. And Peter was one of those people who's got remarkable steering abilities. So he got the meeting to the right place. Um, Brian Haynes, also from McMaster, was the first um, director of Cotton Canada. Dave Sackett was the first uh, um, um, uh, chair of the Cotton Steering Group. And this book, which they wrote with Gord Guyatt, it was one of the other sort of streams of intellectual thought that went into Cochrane. So I think Cochrane came about because we had you know, UK and Ian Chalmers, we had Canada with Dave Sackett, and also there's Tom Chalmers based out of Boston. Uh, and then the, this is um, Andy Oxman. So this is for the medical students in, in the room. When he was a medical student, he actually designed the first systematic review course in the world. So you have to think about what are the kind of knowledge needs I have to, I'm gonna have over my career and then design a course and take it to the dean and say, we should be teaching this here. Um, that's kind of what he did. So quite a remarkable cadre of individuals. So what has Cochrane done? This is a Cochrane library. There are currently 8,200 published reviews, and there's another 2,300 ongoing. There are reviews covering most aspects of healthcare, both high tech, but particularly low tech. Uh, and they've also, Cochrane's also helped identify over 1.6 million randomized controlled trials. It's a very huge resource. Cochrane is available to 3.6 billion people worldwide, free at the point of contact. Unfortunately, not in Canada, and there's a backstory to that that I could talk about. And at the moment, 63% uh, of the reviews are available open access, and that's increasing year on year, and the aim is to make all this open access. Um, and this is just to sort of say, you know, basically Cochrane updates reviews when new information becomes available. So this is the latest update of that Patricia Crowley review. Published in 2017, uh, you can see that you know, what one woman could do it had to be taken over by, well, I suspect, three women and a man. Uh, um, uh, um, and now there are 28 studies looking at RDS, where there were 12 originally. Um, you know, there's a, you know, increase, probably double the number of participants, but the effect size is pretty constant. You know, you're still getting very similar benefits. These are the data I used to kind of to look at the benefits for uh, Ontario. Um, Cochrane has, in addition to all the scientific stuff, a plain language summary. Every review has a plain language summary written for a grade eight um, community. Uh, one of the things Cochrane has made a, a, a real push on is try to improve linguistic accessibility. For those of you li who live in the Anglophone world, we forget the fact that 90% you know, of the scientific literature is published in the English language. And if English isn't your first language, even if you're professionally trained, this is a challenge for you. So Cochrane is committed to translate uh, some of these plain language summaries and abstracts into all six WHO essential languages. And you can see that when you go to a Cochrane review, you've got a choice of languages, so you can get it in French, you can get it in Russian. So again, this is an idea, once someone's done the work, other people can come along and bring, you know, basically package it in ways that will improve accessibility for others. Um, Cochrane also works with WHO and Wikipedia, so that we've been working with Wikipedia to try and ensure that uh, all Wikipedia editors have access to Cochrane, so that hopefully they'll cite Cochrane in Wikipedia, which is the most widely accessed health resource in the world. And then you have other factors. Stephen mentioned this earlier, but uh, CRISP, uh, the program that he runs here, uh, basically sort of takes questions from the government or from the health authorities here and goes out to try and identify high quality reviews like Cochrane, like, um, uh, uh, or other reviews, and then contextualize them for a Newfoundland setting. So he couldn't do that if Cochrane didn't exist, or it'd be a lot harder. Having Cochrane allows groups here, elsewhere around the world, to basically repackage this and provide <coughs> evidence-based guidance to their government, their healthcare system. Uh, the last few slides on Cochrane, one of the things that Cochrane did, I, I mentioned that this book was uh, created with uh, a consumer organization in the UK. Cochrane, since its starting point, said consumers, patients, um, citizens are a key contributor to what we do. So we've established a Cochrane consumer network and our consumers are involved in, some of them actually write reviews. A lot of them help with kind of basically prioritization of questions and outcomes. 
A lot of them talk about, uh, we'll um, have the peer review and they'll help write off plain language summaries and often they'll use them in their own setting to try and promote evidence-based care. So in Canada, we've been talking about patient-oriented research for five or six years. In Cochrane, we've been doing it since 1993. Um, and you know, it's something that's just one of the pleasures of being in Cochrane. And then most recently, Cochrane is creating a crowd, sci uh, become a Cochrane citizen uh, um, scientist. So it's trying to make crowdsource the conduct of systematic reviews. You can break systematic reviews into very small chunks that don't need a lot of expertise, and then people who've got an hour and want to contribute can go in and sort of basically do those activities, knowing they're contributing to this global venture. And so far, we have 15,000 people who from around, the, from 146 countries have been involved and have classified, have been involved in more than a, you know, 3.8 million activities. So this is very much about sort of, um, you know, I think it's, a, I mean, people in Cochrane see this as a social good, and it's things that we want to, um, uh, uh, you know, we think that we should, you know, people should engage and can get involved. And if we go for, I mean, there are Cochrane does you know, a lot of reviews, and lots of other people do reviews, and now system reviews are the evidence based inside of many evidence based tools. If you refer to guidelines, if you look at health technology assessments, if you look at decision support, you are using, in the vast majority of cases now, system reviews as the evidence base. So, you know, this sort of thing now is this kind of endemic, it's kind of just out there and supporting virtually all aspects of health decision making, as it should. Um, all right, I'm gonna change tack a bit, okay? So, in health, you might expect, I mean, health, you know, we always think we're scientific based, so this was probably kind of a quite natural evolution. But the same arguments are happening in other sectors. So the same push for evidence-informed uh, policy is happening in international development, education, climate justice, and what we're seeing is the evolution of similar international efforts to introduce systematic reviews within these sectors. I'm going to talk a little bit about basic biomedical research and first of all describe why systematic reviews might be helpful. So you know when I moved to Canada I used to have lots of really good fights uh, late at night in bars with my basic science colleagues about you know systematic reviews were really not helpful for basic science. Um, it's much too complicated. So this was um, this was this is an example of a trial uh, uh, which showed no benefit and potential harm of a drug for uh, a drug treatment for heart failure. Sixteen hundred patients were randomised to receive a drug or no drug. And as I said, at the end of the trial, they found absolutely no benefit, and actually suggested that those patients in early heart failure who had the drug might have been harmed. The heart failure community was completely surprised by this. They were convinced that this was going to be the next blockbusting drug that would make a difference. So, a, number, a Canadian group. So you've got um, Duncan Stewart, John Lee Lowe, who are very, very sort of senior sort of um, uh, biomedical cardiologists. Jack Tu, a cardio, uh, cardio, uh, cardi, uh, cardiology epidemiologist, and then more systematic review people said, you know, why, why were we misled by the science, by the animal model? Why did we go to a human study that showed no benefit when we had these animal studies? So they did a formal systematic review where they actually looked across all the animal studies at death as the endpoint. <coughs> and this is the forest plot. So I've talked to you about this, but you can see that, first of all, there were about uh, 900, or almost 1,000 um, animals randomized before we randomized 1,600 people. But if you look at the bottom line here, this is a meta-analysis, there was absolutely no benefit in mortality terms from the animal studies. If you had done this meta-analysis before you went to the human study, you either would have chosen said, we're not gonna do it, or you'd have been much more careful, let's do a 30-person trial and see. So if we had actually incorporated um, systematic reviews as part of basic biomedical science, it would have, it will, certainly in the translation world, it will help us make, I think, more sensible decisions. And in my institution, uh, we have a big basic science model. This is part and parcel of how we do business. We just, if we're thinking about, you know, is this now ready for us to start to introduce into humans? We will do a formal systematic review as part of the evidentiary process of due process. And in basic biomedical research, we have two global organizations that are trying to promote systematic reviews. 
One is called Circle, it's based out of the Netherlands, both of these have international reach, uh, and they came at this from an annual welfare perspective. The systematic reviews might help us think about how we ethically use animals in studies and hopefully kind of either reduce or replace or, or replicate. Um, and then there's another group uh, called Camarade, so it's based out of Edinburgh and Melbourne, and that's using systematic reviews for this translation piece, but also as a driver to improve quality of basic animal studies. Uh, one of the things we're finding when you do systematic reviews of animal studies is if there's not an explicit randomization process, you get larger effects than if there is. <laughs> we found that in human studies 20 years ago. If you don't have blinded assessment in animal studies, you have larger effects than if you have blinded assessment. We found that in animal studies, sorry, human studies 20, 30 years ago. So when we do these reviews, it helps us understand what the evidence tells us, but it also helps us start to think critically about are we doing the science in the most productive way that we can. The same issues are happening in the social and economic policy, and I'm uh, 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 the, the board chair of the Camel Collaboration. Uh, we have groups working in business and management, crime and justice, disability, education, international development, um, knowledge and social innovation, social welfare, and we'll have them in climate change, food security, nutrition. Now when you move into the social science sector, there may be different types of research you look at, but you can still use a robust method to try and make sense of it. Okay? And we're seeing the same in uh, the environment. So the collaboration on the environment and the uh, uh, environmental evidence is based out of Bangor, again has uh, um, um, an international network, the next international meetings in Ottawa in June. Um, so people are using these approaches to say this is a way of grappling with complex bodies of evidence which are of interest to decision makers. Um, and it gets away from I'm going to show you my favourite study and then someone else will show you their favourite study. Here's the evidence we can argue about it. So this is a kind of a global trend. Um, but these emergent evidence synthesis organisations face common challenges. There's an issue about sustainability funding. One of the things is, for some reason, people love systematic reviews. They don't want to pay for them. It's like, so a lot of this stuff is being done off the side of people's desks. But imagine what we could do if we had stable funding. We need to build capacity to conduct and use synthesis, particularly as we're moving outside of health, and there are a lot of methodological developments needed. The other thing is most of the expertise in systematic reviews currently is in developed countries and we need to build capacity in low and middle income countries so that they can benefit. It's not just doing the reviews, it's also the kind of intellectual mass that you get if you do the reviews. So this has led to the formation of something called Evans Synthesis International, which is a, a meta meta organization where we're trying to bring together all of these organizations and saying how can we work together to make these arguments to governments, to others, to say we want to, to take things forward. And just as an example of where we've got to, or, or, or where we can go to with this, um, about 12 years ago, uh, um, there's a recognition of this sort of gap between the North and the South in terms of the capacity to do systematic reviews. And Cochrane recognised that, but Campbell recognised that, some of the group from the WHO called the Alliance for Health Systems and policy research recognise that. And there's a suggestion that we should work together to try and improve basically capacity in low income countries to do these reviews and to help people in those countries to use those reviews. So we established something called the Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative. Um, and this is based out of Lebanon in the American University of Beirut. Uh, and they have identified 47 centres around the world who are able to conduct reviews and provide support to decision makers in those settings uh, about using those reviews. And what we're trying to do is find ways in which we can get funding to help these groups to continue to do their work. But you can see there's a, a big cluster in, in Asia, there's a lot in sort of South Africa, East Africa, West Africa, a reasonable smattering in, in, in Latin America. Uh, and these didn't exist before. Oh, well, some of them existed, but they, were, you know, they weren't visible until this international group came together and said, let's do this, let's sort this through. So, two final slides. I'm very good. Um, normally when I talk about this, uh, and this might come up, there's a question about, well, you know, surely sort of AI and big data are going to just wipe this out and they'll just solve our problems for us. And 
there's a kind of, well, no, I think there's a, there's a known sort of answer to that. So, so one of the issues is we're already using technology to facilitate systematic reviews. Uh, um, yeah, Cochrane's been at the forefront of this, but there are others, and we're doing things like machine learning to help screen studies. You can actually use computers to read a paper for you and tell you, I think this is what the risk of bias is, but here's where I'm looking at, and you can tell me whether I'm right or wrong. So it's not taking the human out of it, but it's hopefully taking some of the grunt work out of it, if you will. Um, and you know, you know, technology first, human second. <coughs> So that's the fact that we can lever advances in computer technology, particularly natural process languaging and other things, to really make this a lot more efficient. The other issue is what happens when we have real-world evidence, big data. Is that going to basically mean that we don't need to have do research, randomized controlled trials, because that will come through? The issue with this is that all data, all, all of these data sources, both randomized controlled trials and real world evidence, are incomplete or have biases. And one of the things we need to understand is, you know, when is, you know, what can we use these data sources to answer in a reliable way? And how do we weight different forms of, system, of, of, of this evidence? So I can't see the real world data is going to replace what we're talking about. But one of the things that systematic reviews are very good at is curating knowledge, thinking deeply about what it means, thinking deeply about its strengths and weaknesses. So I think what we're going to do is find a way of bringing in you know, the broad range of evidentiary resources, but use that kind of critical lens to start to say, you know, where's the, the, the signal in, in all of this sort of noisy data, whether it's in trials or elsewhere. So. Um, I'd be very happy to discuss that if we need to. to. Um, I think we need to make arguments with governments, and this is one of the things ESI wants to do, that we need sustained funding as part of the core health infrastructure. One of the um, analogies I view, Muir Gray um, in the UK said, knowledge is like the clean water uh, of the 18th century. You know, the biggest rise in terms of um, uh, um, uh, improvements in, in healthcare was Forest Nightingale, washing hands, etc. But he says knowledge is the clean water in the 21st century. I kind of, I use the other analogy. I sort of say, I think it's like the sewers. If you're building a hospital, you don't say, do we think the sewers are optional? <laughs> if you're building a knowledge-based healthcare system, then a knowledge architecture is not optional. It just should be how we do business. And we have to make those cases. My guess is that um, the, if you take the Patricia Crowley review, and you actually looked at the economic benefit that accrued from children not dying, who are now active in the workplace around the world, she is probably, is probably a thousand to one leverage of what that cost was. No, it's probably 10,000, maybe a million. You know, these things are a small amount of resource, but if we get them right, they're profoundly powerful. We need better coordination and we need to build a global capacity. Final slide. Um, I think this has been a quiet revolution. We, we, we talk a lot about evidence-based medicine, evidence-based uh, um, healthcare, yet uh, systematic reviews are one of the drivers of that and one of the facilitators of that. Um, I think it would have been a lot harder to make the argument for evidence-based medicine if we didn't have this sort of robust evidence. This is beyond health. This is global. This is sort of across sectors. And we should, if we're investing large amounts of money in research, we should be saying, well, how do we actually make sense for society about what the research tells us for planning future research, for what we do now, what we might do in five years' time? So I think we've built the foundations already, but now we need to build the global knowledge infrastructure. And um, hopefully the people in this room, particularly the medical students, will, uh, will, will help with that. So thank you very much. <laughs>